I don't ever learn from the beginning. I hire a lot of good people. And I've got burned a few times, but I don't care. It's part of the part of the game. Well, you know, sometimes you have a bad meal now and then, but you don't stop eating. So Yeah, uh, you know, exactly right. You don't stop going to restaurants. Tommy, Mellow Yellow. Has anyone ever called you that? Only a few people. <laughs> Only a few people? Only your sworn enemies? Sorry. That's right. Uh, dude, welcome back, man. This is your third time, I believe. And I was looking this morning. Uh, it, you were on twice in 2018. And what's interesting, um, you've had quite the journey since 2018. Short, not It's barely, not even six years since you were on. And I believe you were at about 30 million a year right around that time when you were on the show because i looked in our show notes and i think we had something like that in there and i was like and uh if uh if my reconnaissance data is correct you're like 200 million a year now yeah we should be coming up to 300 this year so it's like i feel like everything's going right like I've never felt this way before. Like I felt this last couple of weeks, like I'm learning so many things of automations and AI and, and really going back to the people and saying, how do we stack the deck with amazing people? Because that's the end I'll be all. We partnered with a company called Cortec in their private equity. And I still own half the company. Not a lot of people bet on themselves. Like even the PE guys, they, the one's coming into town to stay with me this week. He's like, Nobody's ever rolled this much before. Like, I don't know how we let you do this. Yeah. But I, you know, for me, it means the opportunity to help a lot of people. Uh, you know, I'm on a straight course myself to have billions in the account. And, you know, I'm not bragging about that. It's just pretty right. significant because I started out washing dishes and shoveling snow. And people are always like, did you know this was going to happen? And I'm like, every ounce of me did. I didn't know when, but, yeah. uh, you know, billions just, even when I, I got a huge check that, that wired to the account about a year ago, and everybody that knows me said, dude, you didn't change a bit. And that's, I'm pretty proud about that. Like, I'm still humble yeah. and I'm st still super hungry, but I'm having a lot of fun. I'm just, I'm burning the candle, but I kind of enjoy that. I, I like burning the candle. From the perspective I've seen on the outside watching the journey, um, what's jumped out to, yeah like the business is scaling stuff but what seems to really be jump jumping out at me especially in the last year number one is um seems like you're really taking care of yourself man like you're you're um you're in the gym um and i don't know if i just didn't notice that before but it really seems like you're like really putting health number one and then just your personal brand and and how you're choosing to show up every day um you know, we talk about here in the fight that success is an inside out game, right? Like you take care of you, your home life, then the business and stuff. And so I'm just witnessing it from afar um, is what it seems to be. Am I, am I onto something there or am I? Onto yeah. It? You know, I, I, I joined this, this health. It's like through, it's called pinnacle care and I'm getting my blood drawn all the time. I'm cold plunging. I've, I've got a um, infrared sauna. I'm, I'm building a new gym into the house. And just really putting everything I've got into my health yeah. more than ever. I used to go money, time, health. <laughs> mm. And that was the wrong order. But when you when you came from, and I won't say nothing, uh, my parents love the shit out of me and take care of me and always told me I could do anything I want. But time, time used to be, time is still super important, but time without health and money without health made no sense. So... I'm really, really, really trying to, you know, drinking water. I'm taking peptides. I'm taking vitamins. I'm taking creatine. I'm working out a lot. I'm watching cardio. Um, I'm getting re ready to hire a uh, someone to start cooking me healthy meals because yeah, that's the hardest part is eating right all the time. Yeah, it's. Uh, I just finished um, phase one of Live Hard again. I do li the Live Hard program every year, uh, seventy five hard and all that. And phase one. My diet this time was I, uh, in addition to like what I chose to eat, I was carb cycling. Yeah. I never, I'd never carb cycled before, dude. And holy crap, it was great. <laughs> like I, I dropped uh, a little over 15 pounds in, in 30 days and 
you know, just kept on some muscle mass and feel like a million bucks. My, you know, core is strong and, and yeah, the diet is huge, man. So. So my buddy, Travis Ringy was just over two nights ago and he's like, dude, you, you I just ordered half a cow and me and him go back and forth on this health journey. And he's like, dude, have you ever thought about drinking like bone marrow chicken broth for like three days? He goes, you don't lose muscle very little but you lose literally a percent a week of body fat and i'm like i'm all in on that because i'm trying to get 10 percent. i'm at about 17 but you know for the first time in a long time i'm stronger than i've ever been and more importantly i feel comfortable with my shirt off and like i feel good looking in the mirror yeah and i can't tell you what that does to a person it's like i want this for everybody to walk in a room knowing they're secure and they feel good about themselves. Maybe it's your smile. Maybe it's your teeth. Maybe whatever it is, take care of it. Yeah. And I think business is a lot like your personal self. Like I hate going to the doctor because you don't want to hear something's wrong. But when you find out, it's preventable, like yeah. preventative maintenance. And I look at it like your balance sheet, income statement, or your KPIs. People are like, I got enough to pay the bills. I'm good. And it's almost like the doctor. You just don't want to look at it. It's like, hey, I'm good. I have energy. I wake up every day. I don't want to go to the doctor, but the doctor is those financial statements and you got to know if you're healthy or not. <laughs> what, what was the, uh, what was the, the switch for you? Like over the past, however, however long it's been with your health. Like, was there just a moment you were like, there was a moment. My cousin Rachel called me and she's got a doctorate in psychology or uh, anatomy and physiology. And she goes, you know, Tommy, and she's four years younger. And she, she'll tell me anything. We're best. We're great friends. And she goes, you're one of the smartest people I've ever met. You're more driven than anybody. She goes, your success, the way you devour books. I listen to your podcast all the time. I see you. She goes, but why don't you take care of yourself? She goes, you're better than this. She goes, you're not your best when it comes to like, you're kind of getting fat. And man, that hit me. And I go, well, screw you. Thank you. Yeah. I'll and uh, <laughs> it, it just resonated with me, man. And I'm like, then if you're this good, then find me a trainer. And she did. And oh. my cousin went to the doctor, her older brother, and he, he called me up and said, I'm going to have to get on all kinds of stuff if I don't take care of myself. Literally like borderline diabetes, um, blood pressure issues. So he got on a really strict diet, started working out, and we started doing competitions, like betting a lot of money. And then I got a lot of other people involved and, and all of a sudden you start seeing results and it's like, holy crap. And then everybody's like, what do I got to do? And I'll tell you what, the peptides helped a lot. But along with, I went out to Travis Ringy on Ponderay Lake in Idaho and he had a shirt off and he's like, I'm not drinking at all. And he's just slamming bottles of water. Everyone's drinking on the lake. And I go, wow, that's discipline. Yeah. And then I've been hanging out a lot with Andy Elliott and he, he's been telling me, you know, dude, you could be so much better. And I, I'm making a lot of progress. I'm nowhere to where I want to be, but you know, it's just a little bit of consistency and a little bit of discipline and man, you feel better. You got more energy show up in a different way. And more importantly, like I feel better about myself and that's where it starts. When I'm in shape, I feel, I know like I'm not a fraud. You know what I mean? Like, I think it's, <laughs> you, you talked about, you know, it's nice when you can take your shirt off and you feel good with your shirt off. I remember a period in my life where I would pick certain types of shirts or clothes to try and thinking it's hiding your gut. You know, the guys do that, right? You, they untuck the shirt and they wear a long shirt. Like I got a guy down the street. It's funny. He's always out in his yard. He's fat as hell. And he wears the baggy clothes. Like it's hiding his fat. It's like, dude, everybody knows you're fat, you know? So yeah. I don't know. <laughs> um, so the, uh, um, what I want people here. I got a couple questions for you here in a minute, but what I hope people heard in what you just shared is it sounds like you've surrounded with yourself with people that will tell you the truth. Well, there's a lot of, and you're open to it, by the way, <laughs> listen, good friends will have your back. Best friends will tell you what you need to hear. And it's not always great. And thank God I got good family and friends around me. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I believe that your friends are a form of osmosis. You're going to take from them and you're going to start to become who you hang out with. And, and I've said this a lot, but if you don't surround your circle with great people, 
it'll drive you up. It's it's actually turns into a cage and they hold you down. Yeah. And I'm a big person into like literally like everybody's like, I'll always be friends with my best friends. And I'm like, well, your best friends still smoke weed every day. They're drinking a 12 pack on the weekends every day. Why are they still your best friends? Like, of course you're, you're going to watch their back, but if you're still hanging out with them, you're the issue. Yeah. And we, we get raised. We didn't have a choice when we were kids. We went to school. We, we had the playground and we had the bus rides and the, our, our neighbors became our friends. And now we do have a choice. And I think people just say, well, you kind of got to do it. They're your friends. And I'm like, what do you mean? You don't have anything in common anymore. Right. Like, I'm not giving up on the guys I, I grew up with, but, you know, we have a choice. You, you love them, but you limit the time, right? So it's it's just, you know, you got to be you got to be picky. And um, and I, I can say the same, you know, when I started making choices around about who I hung out with and uh, and who I decided to remove from my you know, life to some degree, shit got better. So, um, I got better. Um, so listen, you, uh, last summer, your, your book elevate came out, right? It's like last August, July. Yeah. Like that. Okay. Yeah. Um, I could go down the path of talking about the book, but I we're, we're live, we're live here on an interview. I, I want people to, we're going to drop the book in the show notes. We'll get it all over our website. We'll send it out guys. Just buy the book. Cause I got a couple other things that I, uh, I'd love to pick your brain on that I think will be super helpful. Um, but I want to cover the book. One thing from the book, I just want to ask you an open-ended broad question. Here. If you could share one concept from the book, you were only allowed to share one concept in a minute or two that you think is most helpful to somebody from elevate. What would that be? Yeah, the whole premise of the book is build a business where everybody wins. The clients, the owner, the employees, the customer, which is the client, the uh, the vendors get to win. Everybody should win. And the concept of the whole book is build a dream so big when you own a business that everybody's dream fits inside. Mm -hmm. So many companies, they're, they're into performance improvement plans and goal setting and everything, but they don't really care about what's in it for them. Where does the employee, and really a lot of my coworkers, right? So- I got to peel the onion back and really find out what makes people tick and what's in it for them. So that way, when I'm sitting down in a meeting, I'm like, you want to buy a house, you want to bring your dad on this golf trip. You want to renew your vows to your wife. That's what's going to push them. Not because you're setting a personal record. No, really, if you're setting a record that aligns with your values and going back to time and experience, like, do you want to own a home? Do you want to own 10 houses? Do you want to mm -hmm. spend time with your grandma and bring her to Italy where she was born or whatever it might be? So really getting that stuff and understanding that. And then even with my vendors, I'm like, what can we do for you? Yeah. Like, what, how do you guys work? What, what products that we sell make the most profit? Like, like, how do I help everybody? Even my com competition, how do they win? Because the world is big enough for all of us to we can elevate the whole industry. So that's really the premise of the book and build a business so strong that no one knows who the, to, who the owner is and, and really helping people figure out their dreams. I love it. And and that ties into one of the topics I want to, I want to um, touch on. So dude, this is funny. Last, I think it was last fall, end of summer or fall, my wife and I are pulling out of the garage, pulling down the driveway, garage is coming down. All of a sudden I see this like explosion behind me and, and uh, the spring just annihilates everything. Right. I go to, uh, go to Google, type in garage door repair, the stickers on my garage next to it. Now I think it's, uh, I think it's, is it, I should know. Cause I see it every day. Don's. Yeah. Don's. And, <laughs> um, and the tech comes out funny as hell, man. And there was just something about the interaction with the kid and the technology and some of the things coming out of his mouth. And I go, Tommy Mello own your business. And the guy kind of laughed. He goes, yeah. And I go, look at that, man. That's crazy. So, <laughs> um, so he came out to fix the garage and then he upsold the shit out of me and uh, all that. So my point <laughs> is your training's working, man. So it was funny. It was funny though. I'm like, damn it, Tommy got me, um, but I needed <laughs> it. See, that's the point. That's the point. And dude, I went to, um, I actually, I didn't go to Google it. I went to, um, 
and I have a point of this for the contractors listening. I went to maps and I typed in garage door service. Yep. Just what I do. And I think I just called and it was like after hours too. And I, and I called like the first one. I didn't even remember the name. Don's was not the first one that I called. They, but they answered the phone. <laughs> yeah. They answered the phone and they got the work. And I'm just, I want to share this that, you know, time kills deals. Speed is king. And what you got going on there, um, you know, with just response times and, you know, the, the guy was out, uh, it was like, by the time we, we talked to him, it was like eight o'clock at night or whatever. So they came out first thing Saturday morning and had us fixed and it was all great, but speed is king. And I just, there's so many contract guys, this is part of the experience, right? It's not just the work of fixing the garage or it's the whole experience. Like I pushed a button, somebody answered the phone, they showed up, it's done. I pushed another button and they got a credit card and problem fixed within like 18 hours, right? From start to finish. Um, so really has no point of what I wanted to talk about. I was just sharing. Yeah, no, I, I love that story. Yeah, it was cool. And I think I took a selfie with the guy and tagged me on Facebook. I'm like, Tommy Mello, your guy was here. Yeah. Well, anyway. Um, so you shared about having a dream so big, everyone else's dream fits inside, which um, I wanted to talk a little bit. I got, I got two topics. Um, we have balloons on the screen. I don't know. You move on zoom now and it does like little thumbs ups and balloons. I don't know why. So um, goals and time. I'm curious, how do, how do you set your goals? So, so, you know, Ed Milet, right. Talks about thinking big. Um, have you just, you always knew you were going to build something like this. Are you intentionally like writing this stuff down or you just know, like, how do, how do you go about setting goals? How do you set your vision? I'm just curious how you approach that, what it looks like for you. I mean, yeah, it's gotta be a massive, massive, big, 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 hairy, audacious goal, right? A hack. And then, you know, what I'm able to do is reverse engineer all my goals. It's pretty simple. I get on a whiteboard, start with the goal in the top, right? Draw a line, like a big slash. And then I, it's almost like a Gantt chart. And I say, it's how I build my budget. It's how I buy companies. It's how I live. I look at four KPIs and I don't really need to look at the, I've got great CFOs and fp &L people and other people, controllers, and, and they do a lot of the stuff. But my main thing is I need to drive this amount of leads. This is my booking rate. Then I need this much conversion rate. Then I need this average ticket. And then I'm a marketing guy. That's where I specialize. So I say, how do I drive these leads and at what cost per lead? And, uh, and right now this year for me is instead of marketing for leads, I'm marketing for people. I think of this 50, 50, 50% uh, 50 of my mental capacity for marketing goes, how do I drive more leads? And cause we got to worry about capacity planning and it does, I can't just say, here's a new technician. I got to recruit one out of a hundred, get the job. Then I got to get them into training. Training takes a month in their market, then a month in Phoenix. Yeah. And then I got to get them polished. So it's like 90 days before they're ready to really get into the garage. So, I mean, you talk about a dead end road is I could, I feel like I could get as many leads as we'd ever need. Like I really do, even in a depressed economy, but now it's like, how do I get the people? So with those four KPIs I mentioned, I could fix anything. I could literally go in, I could go into anybody's business that's listening and completely change their company around. I could 10 exit. I believe that. And it might be low opportunity job average. It might be their booking rate stinks because they answer the phone eight hours a day and they're not answering it on the first ring. They're not open nights or weekends or holidays. So yeah. that's that's really the crux of it is, I know I'm very intentional. We've got a very, very sophisticated budget that I believe I'm gonna completely destroy. Mm -hmm. Now, not a lot of people think we could destroy it. Now they get 100% bonus. All my VPs, uh, corporate level, all my uh, directors will make a hundred percent bonus if we hit a number. They get a two hundred percent bonus, so they're making one hundred twenty. They make an extra two hundred forty thousand if we hit our stretch goal. And there's no doubt in my mind we're going to hit it. I mean, yeah. we murdered January in a good way, and uh, it's only going to get stronger and better. I'm, I'm bringing in a lot of technology. We're using Rilla Voice. We're using this company called Chirp. 
that I figured out a way to make an extra million dollars a month, a bottom line EBITDA. And we're, we're going to lock ourselves in a room next week and get all the, uh, the automations built. We've already got a lot of them running and it's, it's like everybody's trying to figure out how to play checkers. And I feel like I'm 10 moves deep in a, a game of chess. And I'm not trying to say I'm smarter than anybody. I just, I'm always learning. I'm always right. like asking for more. I'm networking and I'm talking to other contractors and other industries. And I, the difference is, is I take it and I apply it. Like you yeah. can learn all you want to, if you don't apply the knowledge, it's useless. And a lot of people go to these seminars and like, oh my gosh, and then life slaps them in the face. A truck gets in an accident, their top guy quits, they lose their accountant and uh, they're back into the working in the business again. And it happens all the time. Yeah. You you used a word earlier, just very casually that I picked up on. You talked about hunger, you know, and I think that's one of the, I think one of the key elements to being successful over the long haul is not to be, um, is how you show up after you're winning, Right. A lot of people take their foot off the gas. They hit a certain milestone and there's a certain number of people, you being one of them, who remain hungry. And uh, I know um, in what's the book, uh, Brennan Burchard's book, one of his books, uh, something uh, habits or whatever it was. Atomic habits. No, that's James Clear. Um, I can't think of all the author's names. High performance habits or whatever it's called. Yeah. Uh, anyway. One of the high performance habits that Brennan studied over all these people was necessity. That when your necessity is high, you show up, you implement, you stay hungry and this and that. So I'm curious, what what's the driver at this point for you that creates that necessity to, to stay hungry? You know, there, there's obviously money. And money's not the root of all evil. The love of money is. And yep. when I, on our first transaction, when we took some chips off the table, there was 25 millionaires. Yeah. And right now I created a path of what, what we call profit units, where every level is getting these units, the top performers. So we're going to change hundreds of lives on the next transaction. And what I realized is money is a really great tool. I've helped out a lot, like not only 25 millionaires, but a lot of people got $100,000 gifted to them from me that I wanted to help out. A lot of them, you know, are past 65 years old that I feel like have moved me in a lot of directions that they don't have this long life. Like I'm going to invest in a lot of people's dreams. I want people to be like, I can give anybody money, but when I give them a path to incubate their dreams, it's completely different. Now they walk in a room, they're like, I did it. And Tommy believed in me enough to help me and it gave me some direction and I grabbed it and took it by the horns. But so part of it is just, I feel like an obligation to still help a lot of people. I'm not done yet. I didn't, I didn't do what I've intended to do. So I got to keep, keep, keep rolling. Plus the private equity and all the limited partners invested in my dream. So I, I owe them a good return. And uh, I'm, I'm designing a life. I'm taking 75 years old and designing the life I want. Every little detail, faith, community, personal, habits, rituals. I'm literally designing the life. I'm manifesting the life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm going to do this where I'm burning the midnight oil for a few more years because I feel like I'm not done. And then the life I'm going to have is a lot more freedom, but I'm still, what I've realized now is I've had to take myself out of a lot of the things. I've had to fire myself from almost everything. Yeah. Set my superpowers. And unfortunately, one of my superpowers is speaking on stages and uh, sharing sharing as much as possible. So I'm constantly on Facebook and social media and people are asking questions. And when I get a message that I'm my son's soccer coach, I was this close to getting a divorce and losing everything. My business was underwater. Now I'm having dinner and supper every day with my family. Mm -hmm. That's the best gift I can ever get. I mean, for, forget money. Like when I change somebody's life and bring them closer to their significant other and have them show up as a mother or father in a different way. And it's not me. I, I don't take any at all of the, uh, that win. What I do though, is, is say you took it and you ran with it. Like, I don't need to be the guy that people say that to. I just want to make an impact. Impact is a big word for me. Yeah. Well, you, you're, um, you're, you're using the gifts that you've been have, the gifts you've developed, the skills you've developed to help others and they're choosing to do something with it. Right but you're absolutely doing your you're doing your part by opening your mouth yep and um 
and I, and I love that. So you mentioned, you said you're, you're working with 75 years old. What, what, what about that number? Why 75? Well, at 75, you got to look back. At 75, you're probably not. I, I'm 40. So that's, that's 35 years from now. That's almost, it, it's a number where I feel like you kind of are going to reflect and say, what, what did I do in my life? Mm -hmm. I'm not saying that's the end and I'm not saying I'll stop the impact there, but based on every book I've ever read, men, men average the age of 75 to 77. Yeah. And I'm a realist. I know a lot of people go before that. A lot of people go after that, but I didn't want to say, I'm going to look back at my life when I'm a hundred. <laughs> Yeah. 75 just seems to be gotcha. the yeah. number. <laughs> yeah. I was just curious. So the um you said you're you're reverse an engine, you reverse engineer all these every every bit of your life, the business, just like you know, whatever. Um it's a, math, what it's, it's a mathematical equation to me. Yeah. Everything's yes. math. So what what's that look like on a daily practice for you? So there's a lot of alignment. I started with a top 100 project list. I, I coordinated down to the top 30. Then I coordinated, really focused on the top five things. And right now, literally, the biggest problem I'm solving this Q1 is building a spigot for A-plus players. And people say that's impossible. And I'm like, not with the tools we have, not with everything I'm working on, not with affiliate marketing, not with... Like a top, top player. My, I've always worked with my top 10 guys. Like to this day, I, it's almost like a rubber band. I see how far I can take them. People say, well, what about the bottom 20%? What if you move them to the top? I'm like, the top 10% have so much further to go. My top guy will do three and a half million. I think he can do 10. And I'm like, success leaves clues. And it's my job to share those clues. So I study the winners. And I work with the winners all the time. Plus, it keeps me in a good head spot. If I had to focus on the bottom 20% getting their just the willpower that they need. I, I I couldn't do it. So I take the top. And a lot of these guys were, we were out off-roading yesterday and I'm just talking to them and I'm just learning about them and I'm learning about their families and I'm hanging out with their families and I invited them over. They all came over. We, we shut, you know, we bullshitted for a long time and they're like, why do you do this? Why are you letting this into your house? I'm like, you guys are my family. Like I, I care a lot. And I had a bunch of people send me a text message like, we've never been to any house where the owner invited us over. And I'm like, yeah. don't consider me the owner. Like, look, I'm yeah. I'm an employee. I care about you guys. And yes, it's a nice house. And people are like, no one could ever come over to their boss's house. They're going to think they're not paid enough. And I'm like, I don't, I don't look at things that way. Yeah. Yeah. The, um, and to be clear, you're talking your top 10. These are like, because you have how many locations now? You're, so you're talking to your owners. At 38. The locations, right? 38 locations. So your top 10, you are pouring into those top 10 locations over and over and over. I mean, listen, I talk to technicians all day, every day. I interview the top two technicians, not in the company, but the mindset they broke through some type of KPI. Maybe that's service agreements sold. Maybe that's their opportunity job average. Maybe it's just... They're getting a five-star review on every job. And I have them share that. Everyone's got a scorecard. And I rank everybody every month, one through 400 of our technicians. So I'm always talking to the top guys all the time saying, hey, man, what did you figure out? What have you learned? I don't have all the answers. So I ask them for the answers and I have them share those. And it's it's incredible. Every Thursday we play in that meeting, it's 22 minutes. And it's like these guys, that they, they follow the process, that's for sure. But then they say, listen, People are like, how much do you spend on sales? I'm like, a lot, but it's really about being a good human being. It's smiling more. It's it's telling stories. It's listening. It's telling the company story. And everybody wants to overcomplicate these things. Show up, offer them coffee or whatever on the way. It, it's it's not hard. And people are like, how much yeah. of it's psychology? I'm like, there's a lot of words we use and there's a lot to sales, but really just being a good human being. Mm -hmm. Yeah. If you got that portion down, success will find you. I love this. One, uh, for the guy who's listening to this, who knows he needs to train his people, but doesn't know where to start. And I'm talking like a guy who might be doing a million, only a million, right? And, you know, maybe he's remodeling kitchens and he's got a team of three people or, 
you know, and this is a big topic in, in the contractor fight right now, kind of just in some of our channels and stuff where so many people in our community are like, I know I need to train. I don't know what to train them on. I don't know where to start or I can't get people to buy in when I do have a meeting and they all fall asleep. You know, all these things that I know you've been through in the past and figured it out. What do you tell that person? Well, it starts by showing up. I think most, you know, what's interesting is I've had a lot of people come into my office over the last five years. They're like, dude, in my last company, we did 4 million. I never saw the owner here. What were the intentions of the owner? I think that a lot of people want a lifestyle business, but they don't show up to their people. It's their life instead of their people's life. And I don't think that's a great leader mm -hmm. is, you know, I started the day with a morning mojo call and talk about all the big wins from yesterday. And we go through it and then we pick on a couple of guys that we talked to the night before and we say, you had your best day ever. Like what changed? How did it feel? Like you really get the emotions yeah. and feelings into it. What does this mean to you? You made eight grand this week. Mm -hmm. And we talk about the numbers, just like the church talks about tithing and how much they collected. Just like a car dealership talks about selling cars. This is not bad. For some reason, blue collar workers think, oh yeah, sales are bad. And they pride themselves on giving their customers a great deal by shitting on their people. This is what drives me crazy. Yeah. How could you charge those prices? Well, my people are allowed to make more than $45,000 a year and buy a house and have PTO and spend time with their family, put their kids in private school and have insurance in a 401k and drive a new truck and have the latest software. Well, you guys pride yourselves on shitting on people that work for you and never making sure you hold them down in the gutter. In, in the worst parts of the world, I pride myself on lifting people up. And that includes my clients, more importantly, my internal people. They're allowed to do great and there's no limit to how much they can create for their family. And I just think it's funny because the people that brag about giving customers a good deal, they can't afford billboards. They're not on service time because they can't afford it. They're literally like their office looks like crap. They drive used yeah. trucks and pride themselves. I got a good deal on a 2005 E350. And I'm like, why they're like yeah. I, I just I, I look at these people and i say i feel bad for you because i was that person i did a short video the other day where i shared that this is in the early 2000s i fired seven we had 12 employees on a job i had 12 employees at the time i fired seven of them within a 20 minute period on a job site we were all on I didn't plan on firing seven of them, but I fired the one guy and then the other guys, well, he goes, I go. And this guy had a ride with this guy. I mean, dude, it was like this chain reaction. But the seven I ended up letting go were all the toxic guys that we were letting run the company. Like they were trying to tell us how things were going to be done. And because of fear, we we held on to them too long. And so uh, they left, so I'll fast track the, the, the story, um, within... And then I pulled the other five aside. I gave them all a 30% raise on the spot. Um, and with those five, we were more profitable when we had all 12 because they weren't distracted with the toxic guys, right? So I called my business partner. I go, hey, I got good news and bad news. He goes, well, what's the good news? I said, I've taken back control of the company. He says, what's the bad news? I said, we only got five guys left. And then we built on that and we're stronger than ever. But dude, I shared... I didn't share the whole story because, you know, reels and shorts, you know, you kind of just get to the point and tell the story. Um, I got so much hate mail for being like a corporate ogre who's just greedy. Yeah, you were more profitable because you fired those guys. And of course, now you kept more money and this and that. And to your point, just this. And these are contractors weighing in on this shit and just how small minded people are about when you about earning money. Like it is a good thing to earn money. You shared earlier that, you know, the lack of money is not the root of all or money. Oh uh, yeah. Money, but people I think, think, I think the lack greed. of money, I think the lack of money is the root of a lot of evil, you know, but, and it's not like you said, it's, they think it's being greedy where you didn't go from zero to 30 million and then 30 million to now two, 300 million without becoming a better person. Like you had, you had to become someone different to scale your business that way. And that's what I hope people are hearing here. It's like, you've, I, I didn't know you certainly when you started, but there's no way you've scaled this much. I think one of the reasons you've scaled this much is you have personally been become a more 
giving, kinder, genuine, intentional human being. I can't yeah, I help. I can't help but know that that is part of the formula. Is and and you shared earlier what's in it for them. A lot of people don't think what's in it for them with their people. Where you're you're their biggest cheerleader. You're like, dude, let's make you some more money. Like, yeah. And it, it's not it's not easy, but I'll tell you this: the, the funny thing about this whole thing is, I feel like I've been in the business a couple of decades now, and I still feel like it's Monday. I'm just getting started. I I really feel like I'm in the fetal stages. I feel like I'm just I feel like I just started yesterday. Like there's so many lessons, and and I can bring you back to the bad and the dark ages. But I feel like I'm just now. It's like everything's clicking. I feel like I've actually learned so much that I've invested in other things. And it's like, man, when I turn on these little couple dials, it's like these things give off a lot of money, but the change of lives and the equity incentive programs or, or profit sharing, whatever you want to call it, there's equity incentive, there's there's profit units, there's a phantom equity. But my job is to help people understand your, your business should be something you can sell. And it's almost selfish to say, yeah, I want to help all the people that help me come up but I have no liquidation event to help them in a meaningful way. Mm -hmm. So now that I've learned how to sell a business, I'm like, when can we sell it again? When can we sell it again? When can we sell it again? And continue to take chips off the table and do it again and again with other companies. And I'm like, that's when you build millionaires. That's when you change lives for them. And then when people get the money, you got to help them through setting it up correctly that they making money is a different talent than keeping it by the way. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So as we wrap this up, the second thing I wanted to talk about goals and you've done a great thing there. And I love where we've gone with this. I want to touch a little bit on time. Like you're at, you're a million dollar business, a 10 million, a 30 million, a hundred million, 200. Maybe just a, a, your thoughts on when you look back, where did you spend? A lot of people are trying to grow and scale their business. Where was Tommy's time spent through those different seasons mainly? Yeah, it was, well, the first 10 years, it was, um, I was still a technician. I mean, I said I had a business, I had an LLC, but the truth be told, I was still working in the business 24 seven. And what I've really learned how to do is recognize my strengths and uh, hire for my weaknesses where everybody tries to be well-rounded. And I think um, they call it balance. And I don't think there's a whole lot of balance in business. And I think a lot of us, for, we forget why we started. We started a business to have more freedom, more flexibility, and more time. And then you look at your life, and, and I look at your credit card bills and your schedule, and I say, the reason you started has long been forgotten. Yeah, You did this and took these chances and these risks to give your family more. But yet, they've gotten very little of what you started for. So remember... I say, I've always said, well, look at your credit card statements and your 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 schedule. And mm -hmm. you you say, I see people all the time and they lie to themselves. They say, this is why I did it. And I say, so where, where are you at today? What, how's that going for you? Yeah. And they say, it's going good. We bought a house. No one cares. The kids want dad back. Yeah. They don't want this house. They want dad. Mm -hmm. Your wife or your husband, they want, they want their significant other back. And so we lie to ourselves for sometimes very a very long time. And I think that's unfortunate. And I know business is not easy. It's very difficult. If it was easy, everybody would be doing it. Right. And a lot of businesses, nine out of 10 will fail within the first five years. And most businesses, they're not a real business because the minute they leave for two weeks, it falls apart. They tell themselves they have a business and they brag about their revenue to their buddies, but yet they're not keeping any of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. So what are you spending your time on now? The majority of your time? So it's like, it's, it's a lot of a one, but it's in a different facet of a one, but really I live in marketing. I, I'm living my, my personal brand is what grows a one significantly. So it, it opens up doors and I spend a lot of my time now on one or two large problems. I mean, I don't really need to go to work, but I still enjoy going in every day and on the yeah. weekend. Yeah. But I'm thinking about these macro 10 years from now. I'm like such a big visionary. Mm -hmm. And I just try to have really powerful one-on-ones, let them report to me what's going on, how I can help them. And uh, I've learned how to delegate in a pretty powerful way. And I think that's the biggest problem. So many people I meet, especially at the smaller level, say, if I don't do it, it won't get done right. You know, you've hired the wrong people. You didn't put the performance plans in the right direction. 
and you, you always try to hire for a deal. Mm-hmm. You know, people, they, they, they talk to me and they go, why do you think you're successful? And I go, I buy the best. I mean, I spend, I'm going to spend a million dollars this year on myself, personal development. Mm-hmm. And you wonder, you're afraid to go enter into a best practices group and pay for a thousand dollar seminar. And you always want a deal. And everything you do is a deal. And then you wonder why everybody wants a deal from you. And why no, you don't attract the right clients. It's because you, you put it out in the world. Yeah. And everything you do is a discount city. You're, you're, you're literally pushing your vendors to the point where they can't be profitable. And you wonder why clients don't buy from you in a way you want to be bought from. It's because of you. Look in the mirror and you'll find 95% of your problems. Like attracts like. 100%. You know, you know? I mean, that that's... Yeah, you you are the source of all your problems for for sure. Um, all right, I'm asking this next question for a friend. <laughs> I know selfishly, um, you're a visionary. Uh, I am as well. I I have an idea every seven seconds. It seems. How do you not overwhelm your team? Do you have some checks in place where because you could probably walk into any room at any given time and have a new big idea, a new vision, this and that. What? How do you filter these things? to to the degree of knowing when to bring it to your team yeah so you read a book you listen to a podcast you go to a seminar and all of a sudden you got 10 new ideas yeah the biggest thing is get them in a project management tool like monday or base camp or there's a lot of them with sauna and you got to prioritize what's going to make the deepest impact and I, fortunately i've got a massive team that could run 60 projects a week and I built up to that where right now I guarantee if I walked in my office, which I'll be there later this afternoon, both conference rooms are going to be taken up and we've got two other conference rooms. There's going to be stuff going on. They're running without me. Yeah. And here's the biggest thing is I've enabled them and I've enabled them to get more help. I've enabled them to spend money and I've enabled them to make their own mistakes because I make a lot of mistakes and I need them to be hungry for, for learning. And, uh, you know, I got a lot of ideas, but I find find myself still, when I get a good idea, I'm going to make the idea kind of, I'm going to put it into motion. Mm-hmm. And, and a lot of people say that's impossible. Like, you, you, there's no way you can get this done. And I said, if I give you a million bucks and 100 people to work on it, could you get it done? And they say, yeah. And I say, then don't tell me no. The word is never no to me. The word is, what would it take? What kind of resources would you need to get this done? And then let me make the call. And it's got to be well written. It's got to be well thought out. It's got to be well budgeted. It's got to have numbers to it. Mm-hmm. Time, you know, they say smart goals, specific, um, attainable, measurable, realistic, yeah, uh, right. timetable, all that. So I, I get a lot of ideas and they all make it onto a board and then I prioritize them. And man, there's a lot of stuff I'm working on. Game changing things. Like, mm-hmm. and as long as my, Everyone knows that A1 Garage is a service and anybody that knows any of the companies I'm involved in, they know things are not going to be the same next week. Like we built this culture of change. So many people hate it. They get siloed in their own department, whether that's CSRs or dispatchers. So my job is to untangle the web all the time and continue to make sure we're rowing in the right direction as a team, as the cumulative whole. And uh, like I said earlier, man, it's, it's just getting started. And it does mean me saying... Yes, but not now. See, for a guy like me and you, a big visionary, maybe a touch of ADHD, we we like to say yes because we know we could accomplish anything we put our minds to. So the answer is not no. It's yes, but not right now. Yeah. So we we could say yes because we like to say yes. We like to think we can do everything. But this is not. This has got to get on the docket list when this gets accomplished first. Yeah, it's it's the discipline to. Um... For, for me, I've learned that there's certain things that I got to, I got to sit with before I bring them to the team. Like if it, if I revisit something a week later, or if it's still gnawing at me, I know it's important if that makes sense, you know, but if it's one of those fly by night ideas that I'm not, it's not keeping me up at night and I'm trying to solve a bigger problem than I, I let it go, but it's, I've had it. It's so hard for me yeah. because I know every one of these things will have a deep impact and some of them are not measurable. So yeah. they're always on my list and I get back to them. And it, uh, unfortunately I've had to become very patient yeah. and I hate it because I'm like, let's go, let's go, let's go. And they're like, dude, we got a lot going on. Like, mm-hmm. and it's so hard for me. Cause I'm like, so now, you know, like I said, they gave me a lot of money. So now sometimes I just hire a consultant to get things 
going. Yeah. And I'm like, I'm going to need you for two hours a month. And this thing's going to be built for us. Right. So I go, once again, I'm like, I'm not the, the best. I don't ever learn from the beginning. I hire a lot of good people. And I got burned a few times, but I don't care. It's part of the part of the game. Well, you know, sometimes you have a bad meal now and then, but you don't stop eating. So yeah, uh, you know, exactly right. You don't stop going to restaurants. Well, dude, I uh, I appreciate you carving out so much time here, um, and and just where where you allowed us to take this today. I it was kind of cool just to pick your brain on some of these things and how you think. Um, like I said, we're gonna we're gonna get the um, all the links to your your books and you know elevates the latest one. I encourage people to grab. But where where do you want people to go? Reach out if they want to learn more, get more involved with whatever you got going. Maybe they want to come work for you. Whatever it is. So the best place, and I get this question a lot. Just go to Tommy Mello, and there's no W T O M M Y M E L L O dot com. And you can follow me on all the social media. You can find the books. If you want to come to a shop tour, it's tommymello.com forward slash shop. I don't charge for those. I give you some books. You learn how I structure my equity incentive program, how I do performance pay from CSRs to dispatchers to technicians to installers. I'm going to show you my training center. I'm going to show you some of the technology we're deploying. And I do that because people used to open up their door to me. They used to say, come on in, sit down with my CMO, my CFO, go through my training. And because so many people opened up their hearts, their their house, their business to me, I think it's only good that I pay it forward. And that's why I do that. And it's, it's a win-win because people will come into town, they'll be like, here's what we're doing. And I'm like, wow, that's amazing. We're gonna implement yeah. And it, it's networking and it's, it's, it's something that I think people just need to leave their business and go with a fresh pair of eyes and look at what's going on somewhere else. And it, it's the number one thing. Success leaves clues. All you got to do is supplement. Them. I love it. We'll drop all those links in here. Um, guys share the show with somebody that, you know, um, Tommy, you also have a show. Where can they find that? The home service expert. Yep. It's well, we're, we're number 13 nationwide in business right now. And it's, it's not always about home service. Um, uh, it's about business. Yeah. So, and sometimes it's about as much as recruiting or branding. Sometimes it's about something like culture, you know, but it, it, it's all important things and uh, very proud of it. I use that as my counseling. Like I get someone on and I get to ask yeah. whatever. <laughs> Absolutely. It's your, own, it's your regular therapy session. So that's it. Well, man, I, I appreciate you. Like I said, hanging out. I know, um, we got something possibly in the works for later this year that that we got to have a discussion on that we'll be dropping out to uh, our fighters here soon. Uh, once we figure a couple of details out, I'm excited for that. And um, it's great to have you back. And um, keep doing what you're doing, man. It's it's an inspiration to a lot of people. Super proud of what you're doing. Helping Thank you. I appreciate being here. Man. Hundreds of thousands of people. You are truly helping people get better. You're being a great example of what success looks like. Um, and uh, keep hitting it, man. Appreciate I will. It. I'm going to try to make your uh, your to be determined thing make make it work. That's right, man. We'll, uh, we'll get it ironed out. So appreciate you, man. And, appreciate you, Tom. Uh, we'll Thank you. you.